The Wrestling Life. It's Christmas. Baby, please come home. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 253. It's December 4th, 2020. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, for once, we really do have so much to talk about this week. Yes, and as always, so many things we can't talk about right here on the first and only wrestling podcast. Yep, so the big news is uh, whatever happened on AEW Dynamite this week. It was their big Winter is Coming show. They uh, they paid an absolute waste of money to to use a uh, a tagline from a television show that's no longer on the air. And uh, it was a newsworthy show, though. Kenny Omega won the AEW World Title, and Sting debuted in AEW. Just quick bullet points before we go into picking this apart. <laughs> What were your thoughts on the uh, the big uh, the big news from uh, Dynamite? Um, I enjoyed Sting's debut because I like Sting, and uh, my my most important priority when it comes to AEW is Tony Schiavone's happiness, and <laughs> that that man I've never I've never heard a person so happy as when Tony Schiavone got to announce that Sting was back on TNT after 18 years. Like, what a, what a happy man. Isn't it almost 20 years? I think, yeah, I think it's closer to 20 because it was March of 01, so it's at least over 19. Yeah. Yeah, it is almost 20. Just a continuity error that I found. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but, uh, like, overall, I thought that was cool. Um him going around the ring and staring at various people and then doing a woo and walking off. I think it's it's effective. It got people talking, got attention from like that I think they haven't gotten. Um I think it's all you know, and again, who knows what internet views mean, but he he got some attention and he sold a lot of t shirts already. So hey, I mean there's there's value in Sting, whatever he is on TV. Uh, he, you know, has value as far as getting attention and being like a media guest and selling action figures and shirts and stuff. So, I mean, I, I thought it was, I thought it was enjoyable, obviously follow up and what exactly his role will be, will be, will be key elements as to whether or not Sting continues to be a, a good part of Dynamite. But I thought it was all, all fine and good for week one. Yeah. Well, you know, he's 61 years old. <laughs> but he doesn't look a day over 59. That's true. That's true. He looks younger than Jericho. Uh, <laughs> and moves moves much better than Jericho. Okay. Also, Goldust is 52 and moves better than... Looks younger than both of them. But <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Sting is cool. They'll use Sting well. That's fine. And then you have... Uh, the whatever the main event angle was, where Don Callis, an executive vice president of Impact Wrestling, who has been a television character a couple of times before calling Omega matches, helped Omega win the AEW world title. Then they sprinted for a, a waiting car, and Callis said, Tune into Impact Wrestling on Access TV on Tuesday. Uh, for uh, to hear from Kenny Omega, so the big Winter's Coming episode of AEW Dynamite ended with a plug for Impact Wrestling on Access TV, which is only in like 30 million homes uh, on Tuesday night, and then Eddie Kingston could be heard in the background screaming how he didn't want to wait anymore and he wanted Lance Archer right now, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, I have, I have no idea what that was. I assume they were taping something for, for next week's show, but uh, that was just never addressed, and it was super weird. So uh, WCW is in the DNA of this company. 
and uh, as is TNA. Undoubtedly. And so now they'll be working with Impact Wrestling, obviously, in some form or fashion. We'll have to see how it plays out. But my immediate reaction to this was there's absolutely no benefit to AEW to working with Impact Wrestling. What do you think? Yeah, I don't I don't see one. Like I don't I don't think it hurts them if but like other than some talent sharing which like if it, unless they want to use Impact as like their evolve and they're going to send all of these like young people that they're signing to and the Sean Spearses of the world who the, the creative has nothing for you types to impact and uh, use that as like a farm system. Um, even then, I I feel like you'd be better off just just doing another show on your own. And like, I don't know why you need impact for that. And it's like, who can impact supply to them? Well, okay, Don Callis as Kenny Omega's manager. That's fine, right. I guess. Um, Callis is a good talker and. Uh, uh, and Kenny is a unique promo, so having a guy <laughs> uh, a guy that can cut more traditional wrestling promos might actually be good for him. And it's a real life connection and all that. So that I think that's fine. But as far as like who could on that Impact roster, it's like Brian Myers and Rich Swan and Swoggle <laughs> and like, like Ethan Page's contract is about up. I think other people have just left. So, like, now I did mention on one of our last shows uh, uh, that I thought there was a chance the Young Bucks and Motor City Machine Guns were going to work together in the yeah. near future. Yeah. So, I think more tag teams is fine if you want to bring them in for a program or whatever. I guess that's fine. But none, none of that seems worth ending your show, your big, highly publicized, highly hyped show with a plug for somebody else's TV. Um, because, uh, and, and the rating, the rating or the viewership was up, the 1824 number was good and all that, but will it still be up in six weeks or will we be back around 800,000? Because to me, it's the thing. It's like you can, you, NXT, for example, has you know done big shows and brought, or they've brought in main roster people and they've done close to a million or a million viewers for one week. And then they were back down around seven hundred thousand the next. So my thing is like when you when you build these big shows and you know you're gonna have a bigger audience. Yes, you did a title change and a heel turn, but I feel like the title change and the heel turn was secondary to everyone going, "Wait, what? He, he's gonna be on Impact? Do I have that channel?" Turns out I don't. By the way, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely bizarre. Absolutely bizarre. So you get uh, Orange Cassidy and MJF for the Dynamite Diamond Ring next week. Who could possibly care? I uh, love you the have... Dynamite Diamond Ring. I won't hear it slandered. Uh, I can't stand so it. Dumb. It's so dumb, but I love it. It's, 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 it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best I got for it. That's fine. I just think it's a weird... Like, I like the idea that, assuming it should be won by a bad guy, every year because then he has a finish to his match for an entire year <laughs> yes he, not, he just kind of has an accessory I guess right more accessories in wrestling is what you're calling for here yes <laughs> definitely accessories that can be used as weapons especially okay all right well yeah so that was uh that was the big oh the uh, the inner circle might be breaking up for no reason, I mean I guess there's a reason. It's Jericho and and, uh, and MJF. Are we are we getting the the horseman beat down of Sammy here, or is it too soon to pull the trigger on on that? I um I don't know that um, I don't know that we are or we aren't, um, but uh, it certainly makes sense. I just don't know why, like, why is Jericho in on, um, would, why would Jericho be in on a horse movie down with Sammy, his pal? He likes MJF more? <laughs> I don't know. 
I mean, yeah, like that's maybe what makes me think it's too early because as of now, like like last night, they did the bit where MJF was clearly coming in to throw in a towel like he had done to Cody, but then he like, but then Sammy took the towel, and when Jericho looked over, Sammy had the towel. So I think you need to do a little more of dissension of of Sammy uh, before before you do the big turn. Because yeah, I think that's fair that Jericho and him are buddies, so he would Jericho wouldn't be in on it, and unless he's just a he's just an evil guy. Yeah, uh, I also am just not a big fan of Sammy Guevara as a babyface because I find him to be one of the least likable people uh, in wrestling. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a fair point. Uh, I, mean, I think there's like something, there's something inherent beyond his personal uh, bad things that he may have said in the past. Yeah. Um, like he's also just, I think, inherently like on TV is <laughs> not like he's very unlikable. Like he's the type of guy you want to see get his ass beat. Like so, I, I, yeah, I would. Uh, I, I I don't know. Maybe he'll be really good at it and he'll surprise me, but it just seems like that's that's where we're headed where or unless you're because it doesn't seem like doing a full civil war is in is in the offering, but obviously they're they're playing up that like Santana and Ortiz and Sammy all don't trust MJF. So like it it like it doesn't really make sense unless Jericho's either an idiot or <laughs> or or is secretly way more evil than he has been portrayed on TV recently. Sure. Uh, I did enjoy the MJF already, like after a one week in the group, uh, <laughs> coming, <laughs> showing his true colors already and threatening to throw in the towel uh, mm-hmm. for Jericho. Uh, even though it's probably like storyline wise, it's probably like six months too early for that. Yeah. I was going to say, I thought it was funny. They like doubled up on that. Or on the MJF is a snake stuff because they in the battle royal, uh, Sammy and Jungle Boy are fighting on the top rope, and MJF runs up and eliminates them both. And then we came back and we did the thing with the towel like two two segments later. I was like, wow, they're they're really hitting that hard. Yeah, that happened. All right, so that's uh, that's uh, AEW Dynamite talk. Sting, we'll see where it goes. Cody continues to work with all his childhood heroes. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's that's one thing I would like to mention. Uh, why why is Darby Allen the TNT champion? Um, I don't know. Has he defended it yet? No. And I think his, I think he's he lost the first match he had on Dynamite after winning it, and then they won the tag match and then got beat up here and were saved by a sixty-one year old man. Yeah. Uh, Orange Cassidy should have beaten Cody. I think I said that before, but, but Orange Cassidy should have been the one to beat him for that title. And Not that I don't think there's potential in Darby or whatever, but I just I don't think Darby doesn't need the TNT title right now because all of his stories, the Taz stuff and whatever, they're, if they're going to do something with him and Sting, doesn't feel like the TNT belt is important to any of that. So you think maybe they um, they're a little bit underplanned? Well, I think may- maybe there was like a long term plan a while ago for Cody to eventually lose the belt to the Darby, and then Orange Cassidy in the meantime got really popular and did the program with Jericho and beat Jericho twice, and it seemed like he was the right guy for that spot. But Cody had already decided that Darby was the guy he was going to lose to, and so he lost it to Darby. Uh, that's that's kind of my feeling on it was that they decided a while ago that oh well the the run Cody's run will end but with him putting over Darby and right. when it, when they should have called an audible and gone uh no Cassidy's the guy right now we can build Darby up in a few months and have him beat somebody else for it but Cassidy would have been the guy at the time if Cody was going to lose it or Cody should have just kept it if since he <laughs> like either way it doesn't really seem like it matters who the TNT champion is in this in this scenario right now. Yeah, no, no argument here. Yeah, I, th- I have a lot of issues with their booking. Hey, why is Matt Hardy a heel? For no reason. He's, uh, he's so many, he's got all these characters. And I'm sure if you watch his YouTube channel, Ethan, he explains it very well. 
I'd honestly rather put <laughs> put push pins in my eyeballs. <laughs> I don't know, man. Like that's that's always my impression of Matt Hardy things. Like I'll hear like a podcast interviewer or something or part of something with him, and he'll be explaining all of this stuff in great detail, and I'm like. Not a single word of this ever made it to TV, and you're, this is just all stuff in your crazy, <laughs> in your crazy, con- permanently concussed ten <laughs> North Carolina brain. Like wow. you, you crazy old man, and he's just got all this, th- all these storylines and lore in his head that yes. never makes it to TV. And even when he does have a program on TV, he gets to shoot his angles during commercials most of the time. <laughs> yes, yes. They also just he's like turned heel um, and is like doing his new heel character on BTE and on Twitter and stuff. And as you said, probably his YouTube channel. Um, But they forgot to break him up with Private Party, who he was like mentoring. Yeah. So now they're like, maybe like he threw one of them out of the Battle Royal. Um, So like, I guess maybe they're going to like tease that for a while. But also, what does that make sense? The old the old man is going to feud with the two young guys, <laughs> like unless Matt's going to get another partner and and he's going to feud with Private Party. I don't I don't know that a, a breakup with Matt is like great for Private Party if the idea is to get the young guys over. But maybe that's not the idea. There's just a lot of a lot of problems as we've talked about a hundred times here with letting everyone book their own angle. So someone on Twitter last night said that all of this wacky stuff and stuff not making sense in the inner circle is just a long, long on television rib on the EVPs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that could be. Um, which, if so, it's brilliant. It's some of Jericho's best work. But, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think yeah, you have you have a lot of different booking their own stuff, writing their own promos deciding character turns and i guess the guy in charge is green lighting all of it so yep somebody somebody needs to learn how to say no yep. or not yet at least yep well in wwe um there's some stuff going on uh <laughs> that's pretty much the is show there? now that's pretty much the show notes for this week aj styles is going to wrestle uh, drew mcintyre for the uh, WWE title at TLC, a spot that I guess originally was supposed to be Braun Strowman, but Braun messed up his knee. Uh, turns out maybe putting a spot in every match where the 360-pound guy with bad knees sprints around the ring is a bad idea. Yeah, that poor guy. Like, I mean, he's probably not a good person, but also, like... Watching him run, like, if you watch him from, like, that first feud with Roman to now, like, he can't bend his knee. Like, he's not quite the great Kali yet. He can still run a little bit. But, like, when he runs, his knees are locked. Like, right. <laughs> he's, he is, uh, he does not move. He has not been moving well for a while. And this is just another, I guess, step towards ending up, like, <laughs> ending up like the great Kali. Um, but yeah, I, I, I feel for him in that for the rest of his life, um, he will be asked to do that running spot and he's just going to keep doing it until the, uh, the wheels literally or figuratively fall off. <laughs> yeah. AJ and Drew might be all right. Might be. I'm not AJ, sure. AJ has a big friend. Almost. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't know. Drew said, Drew said, Drew's probably had some good matches this year, right? He's had a couple. Okay. I um, think he's he's lost some um he's lost some muscle mass. A little bit. Uh, and uh is moving a little bit better. Um so maybe we could see, you know, more of the, the Drew that can work is a little more flexible, can work a little bit. Yeah, that'd be nice, and uh, maybe this is like, well, AJ did have a good match with Daniel Bryan on SmackDown like four months ago, so I don't know if he has two good matches in one year in him. <laughs> we'll f- we'll certainly find out. He looked okay um, on Raw on Monday. AJ looked pr- 
pretty good to me on Raw on Monday. Uh, isolate that, please. But... <laughs> and that was just his hair. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so, and then you got uh, Roman Reigns and Kevin Owens over on the other show, which is a placeholder until they go with Roman Reigns and Daniel Bryan, I guess, which may be a WrestleMania program, depending on whether or not they can get The Rock, I guess. I was going to say, if they don't have, if they don't have Dwayne, I would, uh, I would, I would put Daniel Bryan in that spot. Uh yeah. That that makes the most sense to me, and it would be a good match. Yep, there is that. Um, obviously, very sad news with uh, Pat Patterson passing away, and I know there's a kind of mixed feelings uh, about Pat in the um, in the internet wrestling community from um, underinformed or partially informed uh, fans. I know this because. I did a, um, a a video for the Wrestling Observer YouTube channel yesterday, where uh, with some Pat Patterson talk, and the comment section is just a wasteland. Just people talking about, oh, he molested kids and he molested Roddy Piper, and it's like, okay, well, first of all, there's no evidence that he ever molested any kids. Second mm-hmm. of all, th- second of all, Roddy Piper was absolutely out of his mind. And yes. and was liable to say anything. And Roddy's stories were a combination of work and shoot and the stuff he remembered and stuff he forgot about and possibly brain damage. And, like, Roddy, tremendous character, but also absolutely out of his mind, for real. And yeah. I wouldn't put I wouldn't put too much stock in anything that the Roddy Piper says. And I don't say that to insult his his memory or anything. Big Piper fan, but he was just nuts. Uh, yes. So and liable <laughs> liable to say anything. Um, I guess there was a question with the scandal with um, with Terry Garvin and the Ring Boys and the WWF and the late 80s and into like 1990 and 91 mm-hmm. there was a question of what did patterson know and how could you be working there and with like some of the remarks the gorilla monsoon used to make on commentary about the terry garvin school of self-defense and things like that yeah that, that like people that worked there had to know that something untoward was going on with terry garvin and ring boys but nothing was ever proved. Uh, Pat, I just, it's kind of always been the million dollar question is what did Pat know? And Pat was sent home for a year and then brought back. Pat also happened to be a gay man in a time 30 years ago in this country where that was not as accepted as it is today. And where um, we're coming off a decade of um, the AIDS scare in this country and people were underinformed as to the spread of AIDS and and were more prejudiced against gay people than they are today. And it's hard for me to say. And it's not for me to say um what Pat Patterson knew and what he didn't know and what role he played in the WWF scandals of the late eighties. But I think it's fair to say no one has ever accused Pat Patterson of molesting children aside from Roddy Piper, who was absolutely out of his mind. Yes. These, (laughs) those are the facts as we know them. (laughs) No one else ever did except for this one guy who was, insane (laughs) and uh yeah it's a it's a complicated thing because you can't tell the story of wwf slash e's greatest successes without talking about pat patterson um other than vince mcmahon there's very few people that were as integral to that company for a long time as pat was and obviously going beyond the royal rumble and all that stuff 
as a you know he was very clearly was a mentor to a lot of a lot of the biggest stars of of these eras of Brett and Sean especially and um, was seemingly well liked by everyone and and again that doesn't mean that someone that was well liked can also have been a bad person I think we find out almost on a weekly basis these days that someone that was well liked by everyone may have also been a bad person but yes <laughs> the facts as we know him don't know them are not are not clear or do not necessarily there are, there's a lot of strong evidence to say that he, he was directly doing that that stuff so it's it's complicated like i do think it's it should be mentioned if you are talking about him um as, at least as far as what his knowledge may or may not have been and again uh it's it's i think it's it's fair to to bring that up and that, that he was a, a high-ranking official in the company when that stuff was going on but that's i think that's that you could say all of these things and more about vince mcmahon um, and I'm sure we will one day. Uh, let's be honest, Vince is going to outlive us. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, it's a, it's, it, I do think that that obviously complicates things because you can't just look at the the rosy side. Unfortunately, in wrestling, there's often a a dark uh, a dark side of the ring to coin a phrase. Um, and yeah, I, I I don't I don't know much else to say. Like I said, I. I I was struck by a lot of a lot of people uh, either from from this generation, which is funny because there is a story which you I think told me that I was not aware of, which is that in two thousand was around was about two two thousand four, uh, Pat was Pat was uh, put into retirement because he sort of differed with the vision of the company at the time. Yeah, it was between like oh four and oh six somewhere in there, like. You know, WWE made it all the way to O2, kind of on the fumes of Steve Austin. Mm. And then they lost money in O3 for like, it's the only time they've lost money in like the last 25, 23, 24 years. And um, Vince uh, asked Pat, his trusted lieutenant, you know, uh, what's going on here? And Pat said, well, you know, I just don't think Triple H is the guy. And maybe it's time to not have him on top anymore. And then uh, Pat was kind of gently nudged into retirement. And he would still come around for the big shows like Royal Rumble and WrestleMania. And if they needed a finish for something, they would call him. But as far as being there every day, uh, like in the way that you know, the Bruce Pritchards and the Michael Hayes are, he was not and had not been for like 14, 15, 16 years. Yeah, I, I thought that was interesting to see what members of sort of the current generation, and now I guess the, the fact is a lot of the people uh, still working in WWE today were also working there 15 years ago, but um, at least on, on television. Uh, but you know, seeing seeing some of the the women speak about how encouraging he was, the Bellas, uh, Sami Zayn told a great story about how you know Pat was one of his biggest champions in the company, and the night he won the NXT title, if you watch that back, they do the they do one of my favorite things, which is all the whole locker room comes out to put the the new champ on their shoulders, and the Pat Patterson's out, out there, <laughs> and it's because Pat was such a such a huge fan, and they as Pat started to go out with the rest of the roster. They told him not to, and he said, "Try to effing stop me," and walked out there because he was so proud of Sami Zayn. And so, like, it, it is interesting to see that even though he wasn't necessarily around day to day anymore at that point, that he still made such an impact on on uh, a, a lot of the the more modern talent. And I imagine with Sami and Owens both being French Canadian, that probably also has a little bit. It's probably a special bond with 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 Pat over that as well. But I know I know Ziggler was was very close with him, and uh, you know uh, yeah, he's one of those guys who was around forever, so everybody knew him and had good things to say about him, except for a few that didn't. So yeah, it's it's a complicated thing. But I I I, I think what I drew more for, and again, that's not to gloss over the the dark stuff, but. But it, it was interesting to see how how many talents 
even those that maybe started with the company way after his his heyday was over had had such positive stuff to say about him. I also wanted to to bring up something that you brought up offline, and that that two other people have brought up to me off, offline. And you you messaged me and were like, "Man, this is gonna mess with Vince in a big way." Like, and then I had two other people contact me and were like, "Man, we know that Vince is obsessed with his own mortality, and we know that he looks like." <laughs> He looks like a uh, a wax corpse these days, and this is definitely going to mess with his mind even more. And my initial reaction was to tell you, well, I mean, he, Pat was his guy, and he he basically sent him home <laughs> over a decade ago. Yeah, and Pritchard was his guy, and Pritch they fired Pritchard, and Pritchard was out on the outside for like a decade, and. You know, those were the two guys that in the in the heyday from like 87 to 94, 95, it was those three guys sitting around Vince's pool booking the territory, you know, Vince and and Pat and Bruce. And um, but someone else brought up the point. And so my media point was, well, he fired both those guys, basically. (laughs) And so like. So, like, where's is there any ounce of humanity left in the guy? But then it was brought up. It's like, well, when he fired those guys 10, 15 years ago, he was in much better shape 10, 15 years ago than he is today. And that so I, I'm i outvoted three to one in terms of people, <laughs> people coming to me and saying this is this is going to have a major impact on Vince um, more so than I initially thought, at least. Yeah, I, to me, I mean, to your point, there was clearly a time when he felt he didn't need them anymore. But and Pritchard got the call, but Pat obviously didn't um, to come back full time. Uh, so it, that I mean, there's clearly some wrinkles to it, but I kind of see those those relationships the same way I would see like his relationship with Jim Ross or his relationship with Hogan. <laughs> <laughs> like where it's like he will he'll kick him to the curb and he'll bury him but then one day he's going to go back like they'll come back to him or he'll go back to them but like there's always a reconcilement at some point and whether and I feel like Vince is one of those guys that even if even if he wouldn't uh, even if he would fire the guy that he would still have thought of I, I just think I just feel like there he can't have he can't be a guy who has friends <laughs> like Right. When you are when you live the life that McMahon has lived for the last last thirty years, so with the outside of his son-in-law and daughter, like who is left in that in that circle of people? I guess Bruce, like I said, Bruce and Michael Hayes, and I guess Road Dog. And now it's like, but it's like Road Dog is Hunter's boy. Like so, it's like right. it's not the the circle is getting ever smaller, even if Pat wasn't around full time anymore. Like that's. That's not a voice you can call and 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 right. bring him in at all anymore. So I I do think there's there's something to that. Well, it's just like oh, we're we're circling the drain a little bit more here. Yeah. Yeah. So that's pet. That's uh, that's pet Patterson, seventy nine years old. Do we ever get a cause of death? Uh, I don't believe so. So I read, and I, this is this may not be accurate. So never mind. I'm not even going to say it. Like I read something about him maybe showing signs of dementia. I don't know that that's accurate or that that would have been what led to a cause of death. But I didn't see anything specific about like it right. being uh, a specific medical issue or anything. Right. Well, there was talk. I mean, there was talk of that after he, him and Vince apparently uh, carrying on and complaining about how long Rocky Johnson's funeral was going back in January. Yeah. And if you if you look at um, Pat did some interviews for the network uh, at Royal Rumble this year, and Pat did not seem himself uh, on some of those interviews. Or like he seemed like uh, an old an old guy who didn't have his memory anymore in those interviews to me. So I mean, yeah. All right. Well, uh, NXT has pay per view on Sunday, and it is going up against Tribute. Uh, Tribute to the troops on Fox. So there will be there's 
lots of WWE content coming up this weekend. War games versus war guys. Sure. So on the war games, there's the show title. War games versus war guys. Uh, all right. You know, it is too bad that we named the show two weeks ago Batman Returns. And then literally this week, as you pointed out, the Batman returned. Yes, the Batman did in fact return in Sting, which makes me even more furious that they, they didn't use that for the, for the title. But yes, it, it is a shame that we, <laughs> we wasted that one. That was that one. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we could go with like Batman forever, I suppose. Because mm-hmm. Sting, he's, it's a multi-year deal. He'll be in AEW for a while. Yeah. Do you think he does any matches, by the way? I don't think it's impossible. Um, and I don't know that this means anything, but he's on their website and he has a win-loss record under his name. Well, I think that means something. Arn Anderson doesn't have a win-loss record under his name, does he? No, he does not. So, <laughs> Whether it's cinematic stuff, whether it's tag matches where he just does a Scorpion Deathlock, I don't know. Right. But... Uh, I hope everyone's careful. We were actually discussing this off the air. We, <laughs> we never got the spinal fusion surgery, correct? And we don't, at least we don't think. I don't think so. He he didn't break his neck like in a Seth mm-hmm. Rollins match. He got like whiplash from taking a buckle bomb, and he got a no pun intended a stinger, and like had some numbness in his arms and stuff. But he finished that match. They took him to the hospital. They diagnosed him with spinal stenosis. I don't know what the treatment for spinal stenosis is. It's a narrowing of the spinal column. So I don't know if there's anything you can do to treat that surgically. Edge has spinal stenosis back and is, you know, has taken a ton of bumps. Yeah. Sting was like, no, I never got any surgery for that. I didn't break my neck. Uh, I feel fine. (laughs) So. (laughs) Right. And I don't know if he's one of those guys that went to like, uh, the Columbia or wherever and got uh, uh, st- stem cell treatment like Edge and Kevin Nash and Ryback did. Mm-hmm. I don't know if he's one of those guys or not, but he didn't break his neck. So, you know, I mean, taking bumps at 61 is a bad idea, but Agreed. also, also he didn't break his neck. So. Yeah. Know. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I would certainly, I would hope, and think that they would want to keep it limited and that he would want to keep it limited if he is doing anything in the ring. But yeah, that'll be, I don't know. Like I, we've talked about it. They need a baby face authority figure. Not, you don't need him on TV every week for that. But so we, so I can stop hearing Excalibur tell me that Tony Khan has made a match. Like I want, <laughs> I want someone to come out and be, be the the Jack Tunney of this, and you could have Sting do that. Um, beyond that, yeah, I don't know. I guess we'll see as far as him being like in 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 the ring. But that's, it's, I mean, according to Dave Meltzer, who you would think would know, <laughs> uh, he's he's going to be a regular on television. This isn't a bring him in for a spot and then he's off for six months deal. Right. Um, so he's going to be a regular for a while. So, uh, again, as we like to say here, we will file that one under we'll see. All right. So the war games, uh, Timothy Thatcher versus Tommaso Ciampa in a singles match. Dexter Loomis versus Cameron Grimes in a strap match. I still yet to see a good strap match in my entire life. Uh, Leon Ruff versus Johnny Gargano versus Damian Priest for the NXT North American Championship. Uh, the men's war games match with the Undisputed Era taking on Pat McAfee, Pete Dunne, Danny Burch, Noni Lorcan. And then the ladies war games match with Shotzi, Ember Moon, Rhea Ripley, and Io Shirai against Candice, Dakota Kai, Raquel Gonzalez, and Tony Storm. And of course, Tony Storm is now a heel because we just got to turn every natural baby face into a heel. Well, of course, she talks funny. <laughs> Can't be a hero. Rhea Ripley talks funny. Yeah, but she's cool and muscular, and Hunter likes her. She'll be a heel when she goes to Raw, too. <laughs> yeah, there's that. Yeah, so uh, the War Games matches usually deliver. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting. I thought uh, I don't watch a lot of NXT, as we've talked about, but I watched Pat McAfee's go-home promo, and my thoughts was it was a pretty good promo, 
And also, uh, Danny Birch makes really distracting faces uh, the whole time. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but yeah, no, I, I think Pat McAfee is good at making making you want to see him get beat up. So, um, I'm sure the the warning matches are usually very well put together, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of crazy stunts and weapons and brawling and all that stuff. So, uh, the babyface women have the have the man advantage or the the woman. Yes. Pitch. Yes. So a lot of impact angles being shot. Uh, yeah. On, uh, on on all the Wednesday night shows. Pat McAfee is a natural at this. Yeah, it is funny that he was he was a punter and then like a barstool or barstool esque sports commentator, and now he's like, yeah, he's really good at this. Yeah. I I um. I didn't meet Pat McAfee, but I was around Pat McAfee at uh, the Dolph Ziggler quote unquote comedy show uh, <laughs> at, at, Carol- at Caroline's on Broadway at SummerSlam a couple years ago. And I was like, I mean, I was a foot away from Pat McAfee. Um, Pat McAfee is immensely unlikable naturally. <laughs> <laughs> immensely unlikable almost as unlikable as the guy who was there wearing a i'm a charlie caruso guy shirt (laughs) really you are raise your hand if you're not (laughs) brave very brave of that man to let everyone know that he thinks the pretty the pretty lady on television who's good at her job is is good Best thing they ever did was they got Charlie out of there before that show was over. <laughs> she like got she like got on stage, did her bad stand up, and then left. And it was the best thing for her safety. <laughs> anyway, that was the time. McAfee was like with a dude, and they were like pushing. They pushed their way through a crowd uh, because everybody was in their way. And it was just like, he was just so immensely, he was like, he was so immensely unlikable in person. Anyway, <laughs> that's, uh, that's the War Games show coming up this Sunday. Yeah, that's, uh, we've gone on a journey, but. <laughs> we have, we have. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? No, I think that, uh, that about covers it. There's, uh, we spent about as much time talking about NXT as I feel the show deserves. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of very interesting directions that this AEW television is going in. So, yep. uh, as at the top of the show, so much to talk about. Yep. New Japan uh, has uh, been ruining my life for a month straight now. Good time. And, Good uh, time. yeah, that tour is still going on for another eight days. Uh, and then they take, like, a four-day break, and then they do three shows in a row. Where, uh, But the, the good news is the Road to Tokyo Dome tour will end with Masked Horse, Perhaps my favorite character in all of wrestling, Masked Horse. Hell he yeah. was he was uh, abandoned by his parents and raised by horses, abandoned by the horses and raised by a pro wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> it's the great, it's the greatest character in wrestling. Masked Horse comes out and hands out presents on the last New Japan show of the year before the show begins, and then the show ends with the big baby face in the ring cutting a promo and snow falling. It is an awesome show. Look, that, look, we all have things to look forward to. <laughs> Christmas is going to be very different this year for a lot of people, but at yeah. least we have the mass tours and snow falling in the ring. That's, yeah. that's something to hang our hat off. Yeah. Yeah. All right, everybody. Till next time, I'm Ethan. <laughs> I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the rest of life. Adios. for listening don't forget to leave us a five-star review on apple podcasts now here are this week's bonus features hard yeah yeah uh just woke up (laughs) Awesome.
It's uh, almost 7.30 p.m. <clears throat> Correct. Um, yep, 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 yep. So, sorry I'm a little late. <laughs> All right. And uh, the good news is I know what number podcast this is, so that's... Well, that makes one of us, so... An improvement over... How things normally are. <laughs> uh, it's uh, we have the thermostat set to sixty-eight degrees in the house. It is fifty-eight degrees in the room that I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> so apologies if you hear the mini heater in the background, but it has to be on for a little while. I think it's fine. All right. Free flowing conversation and the occasional late touches on my share subject. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Another exciting episode. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I gotta fl- fl- uh, flip the switch and be there energetic. A, there was a show we watched that opened with another something for something. You, um, that's not helpful, I know, but it's just. Another something for something? Like the opening of the show was another hmm for hmm, like whatever the character's name was. It's not, it's like something that our grandfather taped for us. Uh, I don't think it's Wild Wild West. Super Friends? Hmm. Maybe. Oh, Green Hornet. Another challenge for the Green Hornet. His aid, Kato. And the district attorney. (laughs) Half of the the freaking city knows that he's the Green Hornet, but (laughs) it's still a closely guarded secret. Yes, 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 yes. His aide, Cato. His secretary. Yes. And the district attorney. The big three. Yep, you know it. You know, the Green Hornet Batman crossover didn't make any sense because the Green Hornet was a serious show and Batman was haha. Mm hmm. Yeah. So it really didn't make any sense. You know, there's also like they did a window gag like a few weeks, like maybe like, like a couple of months before that episode, too. Yeah. Mm hmm. Where, where Batman and Robin are climbing up the building and the Green Hornet and Kato just pop out. Yes. Which also yeah. doesn't make sense because they t- they talk about being, yeah, uh, you know, people hunting for the enemies of law and order. But publicly, the Green Hornet is a criminal. And when Batman and Robin meet Green Hornet and Kato, they fight because they think Green Hornet is a is a criminal. So I'm I'm starting to think that they they needed a continuity guy on that show. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, they wouldn't be the the first uh, show that needed a continuity guy. It's true. All right. Well, that wraps up Green Hornet Talk, episode one. <laughs> when Fraser Observer Radio is on hiatus, Green Hornet Talk is on. Yeah, as it turns out, Fraser Observer Radio is on a hiatus like six months out of the year because Hallmark <laughs> Channel starts playing Christmas movies in June. Ugh. <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> hey, everybody. What? One day. One day it'll return. Yeah, hopefully. It's not like I just turn on Hulu and have it right there, or Peacock or whatever, and have it right there. Not the same. No. It has to be at the middle of the night on a Hallmark channel. Yep. With commercial breaks. That's right. I try to keep on keeping on.